We're going to be continuing our journey in Ephesians, so if you have your Bible, you can turn to Ephesians chapter 2, where we will pick up where we have left off, Ephesians chapter 2. So we look at this uh, letter of grace that has been given us. In August 1961, many of you may uh, remember or remember the time and the saga of what was going on. World War II had finished years of before, but as a result of that, we began to see a divide in our world and in politics and in the interest as we could come to know that period of time as the Cold War. In 1961, we say we saw the construction of the Berlin Wall, which separated a city and divided a country, East Germany and West Germany. Um, and we saw this as it impacted the world and changed our perspective on things. Uh, an interesting thing about this is that was built, uh, usually when you build a wall, you build it to keep people out. Like we put fences around some of our yards, uh, those kind of things to keep everyone out from getting in. Well, the interesting thing about the Berlin Wall, if you remember the history, it was built so that the people would not leave and to keep them in. So it was basically a wall to confine those East Germans in East Berlin and also in their own country and not to go out and be influenced by the other world. And it was interesting as you study this in history that it was built not to keep people out but to confine us and in today's time, it's interesting how many walls we have in our own lives, how many barriers we have in our own life that we put up to guard us against other people or possibly even to keep people out to keep us safe and where it might be and wherever we might be. But an interesting thing about this, as we know the history, that after things changed in 1989, it began to deconstruct. Uh, in fact, governments changes, philosophies change, leadership change, mindsets changed. And in fact, in looking, I saw one picture where there was an older German gentleman who had a little pick hammer and he was chipping away at the wall. And we began, if you remember that time in 1989 into 1990 when it was completely deconstructed, as you saw more and more images and to the point where we saw images like this where people were standing on the wall and cheering for it to be taken down because it, it was a not so much a wall, but it symbolized confinement and it symbolized isolation and alienation of people. And so once it was down, it gave a sense of freedom to everyone, not only in Germany, but also around the world, that things were changing and there was a sense of freedom. Well, in this particular passage in Ephesians, Paul gives, this, gives us an understanding of what Jesus has done for us to break down the barriers that are between people and divide people, but also to be able to give us that sense of freedom that we have in our daily walk with Christ. Because again, Paul's emphasis to, his, um, to the believers in Ephesus, and again, this letter is written not just to Ephesus, but all those believers who were surrounding in that area. It was considered a circuit letter because it traveled so that people who became Christians and followers of Jesus might understand what they need to do and the change that happened in their life. And that's why you and me, when we look at a book like this in the Bible, a letter that was written to a certain people, we can understand that this is also written for us so that we might know how we are to live in today's time because we still face persecution. We still deal with things in our life. The Ephesians were dealing with a city of great culture, which means it was a city of great influence, that those who followed Jesus and became a part of the way now had to stand up against the persecution that they were facing and all of the influence in fact, remember, as we've mentioned, Ephesus was a city of a great temple, the temple of Artemis, a great God and culture that was there. So there was constantly people saying, you don't need to do that. You don't need to cause the trouble. You just need to go with the flow and tolerate everything else, much like what we deal with today. So let's look at this and pick up where Paul is continuing to write this letter in verse 11 of chapter 2. Therefore, 
Remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ... Jesus, you who once were far away, have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself a new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together in one body, and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of His power. And although I am less than the least of all God's people, This grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery for which ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory." Now, Paul gives us a great teaching in this particular passage of Ephesians as he talks about the continual process of what Jesus has done for us. If you'll remember, back in the earlier chapters, we talked about how Paul reminded us that God is the God who is above all things, and that God is in control of all things, and God sent us Jesus, so that we might be saved. In fact, what we looked at previously in chapter 2, verse 1 through 10, it talks about the fact that we, you and I, are saved by grace, not by anything that we do, not in anything that we can do, but it's because of Jesus Christ. Not so that you and I can boast and say, oh, we're doing a good job. We're living good. None of that matters when it comes to the grace that has been given to us through Jesus Christ in order to experience salvation. And this is what Paul is saying. Listen, you have salvation through Jesus Christ and in Christ so that we might be free and live and be confident. And Paul is saying, what you need need to do now is remember where you came from. Remember where you came from. Paul says in verse 11 that 
this idea that you were once called uncircumcised. Now, for Gentiles, this is something they faced all their life. Have you ever had anybody talk down to you because they thought you were less of a person than they are because of some whatever reason that that might be? This is something the Gentiles experienced all the time from the Jews, from the ones who were chosen, the Israelites. Why? Because they had their law, and according to them, you had to follow that law so that you could experience righteousness. Well, then Jesus comes on the scene, and he changes things up. And this is where a lot of people got mad. But Paul is saying, remember what Jesus has done for you, and remember where you came from. At one time, you were called uncircumcised, which meant that you were alienated from the promises of God's covenant. See, the covenant that God said, here, you can have righteousness and holiness if you follow these commands. That was given to the Jews. And the Jews said, okay, this is ours. And so if you're going to be a part of that, then you've got to follow the rules. Does this sound familiar to any of us in today's time? So what happens is, Paul says, no, remember that Jesus came for all people. You are no longer going to be separated. But he says, remember where you came from. Because you were once called uncircumcised, which means you were once called an alien. You were once not part of God's promises. Can you imagine what that would be like for your whole, your whole entire life to say, you're not good enough to experience God's grace? Because that's what was happening. You're not good enough to experience God's grace, you uncircumcised, because they didn't follow the law. But Paul says, remember that you were once like that. And this is something that is done by the hands of men, not God. The hands of men. In chapter, in verse 12, he says, Remember that at that time you were separated from God, excluded from citizenship, which means you didn't have a right to anything of God's grace because of the law. That you were foreigners to the covenants and the promises and all the blessings that the, the Jews were able to experience. You were alienated from that. You were separated from that. You were separate from Christ. Now, let me ask you this. Do you remember also in Paul's writings that he says that all of us are sinners? And what's the consequence of our sin? What is the result and the cost of our sin? It says that we are separated. For all of us have sinned and fall short. For the wages of sin is death, separation from God. So we were all like that at one time. And so Paul says, listen, you need to remember where you came from. Remember that you were separated from Christ and you were alienated and you had all these things that you experienced. But I love when Paul uses that word in verse 13, but, but, and let me just tell you on a personal note, because I know there's nobody in here perfect and I'm included. There's nobody in here that's not going to go throughout your day and fall to a temptation and struggle with something in your life or have a burden on your heart or whatever it is that you might face that God is not saying this is what you can get rid of because all of us at one point in our life were separated from Christ, every single one of us. Why? Because of the sin that you and I have in our life. Paul says, remember that you are separated, but also remember what Christ has done for you. Remember what Christ has done for you. In verse 13, he says, but in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have now been brought near because of the blood of Christ. Earlier in chapter two, he even says this, that we've got to remember that Christ in all of his great love, he says, but God who is rich in his mercy made us alive with Christ. We are now made alive even though we are sinful. Paul all throughout his writings is having to remind the listeners, listen, where you came from and where you are now is because of Christ, not because of anything you're doing, not because of your attendance here this morning, not because of how much you tithe or whether you're in a Sunday school class. It is because of Christ that you have been made alive. So therefore, because because of Christ, we have something that changes in us and the barrier is taken down. And this is what Paul is reminding them. That yes, we were like that at one time and we were separate from Christ. But now, in Christ, we have been brought near to God. And he goes on and says, for he himself, speaking of Jesus, for he himself is the peace. Now again, you've got to go back and to think about what Paul is writing to. 
Because anytime you do a Bible study like this, you have to consider what's the context of what he's writing to. You've got to remember that Paul was dealing with this internal battle that was going on between Jews and Gentile. There was a great deal of hostility between Christians and non-Christians. Sound familiar in today's time? There's a great deal of division even within between the Gentiles and the Jews because the Gentiles were not following the rules and the Jews were taught to follow the rules. But there's this new concept. And so what Paul is reminding them is that Jesus came to bring peace. He says he himself, which says that he being Jesus is peace. Jesus is the peace. Why? Because when our focus is upon Jesus, we're not worried about the differences that people have because it's Jesus that brings us salvation. It's not the law. So we don't have to worry about the law. We need to follow God's commands. Yes. But we also know that that doesn't bring us salvation. And that's why I say you can have 100% attendance and still die and go to hell if you don't have Jesus as your Savior. You can come every Sunday and be involved in everything you want to, but still be separated from God in your heart when you do not give your heart and life to Christ Jesus as your Savior. And this is what Paul is having to remind the Ephesians, and this is what we are reminded of every single day. That yes, we were separated, but we have been brought. And in Christ, in himself, we find our peace. Look and see how Paul describes this. It says, Jesus made the two one by destroying the better, the barrier. And this is how he did it, by abolishing in his flesh the law and everything that's associated with the law. It's commandments and regulations and all those kind of things. Jesus died on the cross so that we might become this idea of what Christ really intended for us. You see, his purpose was to create one man, which is the resurrection, which is the new body that we now have, the new life, bringing peace to us. Jesus came in verse 17, he says, to preach peace for those that are far away and those that are near, so that we might now have access, so that everybody might have an opportunity to be fellow citizens and have all the rights of God's grace. For those of you that have experienced God's grace, and if you haven't, Like Brother Bob said, I pray today that you will know and understand what Jesus has done for you and that you will accept him as your Savior and know about God's grace. But this idea of God's grace means that no matter what you have done, God can erase that. No matter how far away from God you feel, God can bring you close. This is God's grace. God's grace also brings us to a point that every day when we wake up, we have a new beginning and we don't have to live under the shame and bondage of sin. We are given new life. This is God's grace. And it's something we don't deserve. It's something that God has done for us. That Jesus did for you and me. So when we, when we accept that, then we accept everything about the grace. Not just part of it. Everything that God has given us. And this is what Paul is reminding them. That we now have full citizenship. Full rights. Full privileges that God has given us. So that in verse 22, he says in him that we are built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. That we now become the dwelling. Why? Because Christ now lives within us. But Paul goes on and says, this is for this reason. For this reason. The reason that Jesus has done this great thing for us. The reason that Jesus has broken down all barriers for us. The reason that Jesus has come to give us life and not death. For this reason, Paul says, this is why I continue on as a prisoner. We know that when he wrote this letter to the people in Ephesus, that he was in prison. And Paul experienced that a couple of times. And it's the idea of being able to know what it was like to be confined but yet be free. Not having to be within the walls of a cell and yet still know that freedom comes not from walking out of the cell, but freedom comes when giving Jesus everything about him. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ, for the sake of the Gentiles, surely you've heard about this administration of God's grace. Now, what does Paul mean when he talks about the administration of God's grace? And he goes on and talks about this mystery that we have. Well, the idea that Paul gives us is basically, Jesus has done this for me, so now it's my responsibility to administer that grace in a way that people will know and understand. 
This was Paul's mission all throughout. Why was he beaten and left to die, and yet he still got up and went back into the very city to be able to proclaim the gospel? It's because this is what God had wanted him to do from the beginning, to be able to be a light into the dark world, to share this mystery. Listen to how he reminds the people. He says, this mystery that is made known to me by revelation. The idea that we now have this um, revelation from God through Jesus, the gospel, to be able to share with generations and generations to come. In verse 6 of chapter 3, he says, This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, together in one body, together sharing in the promises of Christ. Every single one who comes and accepts what Jesus has done now is able to take part in all those things. And this is what Paul is saying. This is why I do what I do. This is why it's important for us to work together to see God's grace displayed to every people and revealed to every people. Look in verse 10 of chapter Chapter 3, it says, His intent, His intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. That is, that what we need to do, and this is what Paul is saying, he said, We need to receive grace and we need to show grace. Now, let me, let me tell you this um, this is what I think Paul is saying. For one, we need to remember where we came from, that we're all sinners. We're all separated from God, but through Jesus and in Jesus, he is able to free us and bring us close to God and allow us to get, experience new life through salvation. So that's a great thing. But Paul says there's more than that. And we know this because of all of his writings and all that we have in God's word. Because Paul says this is what's most important. The intent that God had is not just so that you could experience grace, but so that you could show somebody grace. And I'm not saying that you have the power to be able to save somebody else because that's only through Jesus. But let me tell you, church, the minute that you walk outside this door and you say, thank you, God, for your grace, and you're not living in grace, what you're doing is you're confusing everybody around you and this world around you to what God's grace is all about. What's happening is when you live your life contrary to what God's grace has done for you through Christ, what you're doing is you're saying that grace is important, but it's not important enough for me. Because grace, church, listen, grace will change who you are. And that's the problem because some of us don't want that change. Some of us don't want to change our lives. But let me tell you One of the things that we've been learning in, in our preparation for Haiti is the fact that Haiti is not going to be America. I mentioned this to the first, uh, first service. And I said, when we go, we're going to have to remember and get into a mindset that this is not America. So the rights and privileges and things that I'm used to, I'm not going to experience there. Why? Because I'm a foreigner. And that's hard for some of us to understand. If you've ever been in a foreign country and you walk down the streets and everybody's speaking a different language and you can't read the street signs and you don't know what's a restaurant and what's a post office, it's because you're different. You are a foreigner in that country. Now think about this. When you look at God, listen to me. Put your phones away and do whatever you need to, but listen to me. When you look at God... Do you see God for who He is or do you feel like a foreigner? Do you feel separated? Do you feel like there's a barrier there between you and God? God's grace enabled you and I to take that barrier away so that we might see God for who He is, understand what Jesus did for you on the cross, and to know that now we can live a new life. That's God's grace. And Paul is saying there is not a barrier that Jesus cannot take down because he abolished the law through his body so all people could come to know him. What barrier do you have in your life today? Do you really know God's grace? Do you really know what he has done for you? Because Paul says, listen, remember where you came from because you don't ever need to forget what grace has done for you.
And, and the amazing thing about it is, is we're going to continue in this journey and every week, the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at some very practical things that Paul gives us of how to live in that grace every day. So you may say, you may be sitting there and saying, Paul, okay, you say live in grace, but I don't know how to live in grace. We'll come back because we're going to learn through God's word what Paul says. This is what you need to do to live in God's grace that he's given you and how you can be changed because grace does that. But have you experienced God's grace today? Have you accepted what Jesus did for you on the cross? Because if you haven't, you can experience God's grace. You're separated from the very thing that God sent his son to die for. You're separated from it. And you need to make the decision today to accept what Jesus has done for you as your Lord and Savior. So that you can begin to walk in God's grace that he has given you. And you haven't done for yourself. It's only through Jesus. Let's pray.